so the presidential candidate for the United Democratic Alliance, UDA, made four allegations yesterday in his statement. One, that the government and its senior officials have mobilized to campaign for Asimio Laumoja, uh, one Kenya Alliance presidential candidate. Two, that the national government administrative officers, especially chiefs and their assistants, are being mobilized to rig next week's general elections against the UDA presidential candidate through suppression of voter turnout and or buying or holding identification cards. Three, that the cabinet secretary and the principal secretary uh, in the Ministry of Interior and Coordination of National Government and government administrative officers in the Rift Valley, and they actually named four of our officers, I'm going to talk about them, uh, have been holding meetings illegally and planning to provoke uh, ethnic conflict in that part of our country. And um, fourthly, that the government, through the Communication Authority of Kenya and the Kenya Power and Lighting Company, uh, plans to interfere with the conduct of the general elections by disrupting the communication networks and electricity supply. Not, I have expressed clearance from the president to do this press conference because I couldn't if I didn't have clearance from the president to do it because that is how an orderly country is run. Two, um, you go to the National Security Advisory Committee after that and the National Advisory uh, Security uh, uh, Advisory Committee is comprised of the technical officers, the heads of the security agencies and the others uh, you know, who manage um, the security institutions across the country. Then from there we go to the respective ministries and from the ministries we go to the regions, from the regions we go to the counties, from the counties we go to the sub-counties, all the way to the sub-locations. Right from the sub-location, the assistant chief chairs the security committee at the sub-location level. The chief chairs the security committee at the location level and all the way to the National Security Council. It, it, the security sector is a very regimented arrangement. You don't have the freedom and you have no capacity to work outside of it. When we take decisions, for example, if we have to communicate policy to the chiefs and to the DCs and to the regional commissioners, it has got to flow directly from the National Security Council. I am not aware, because there doesn't exist a discussion that has happened at the National Security Council authorizing us to meet the chiefs and instruct them to campaign for anyone. And if His Excellency the Deputy President has got evidence to that effect, he should provide it to the public, because that evidence would reside in the minutes of the National Security Council or in the agenda of the National Security Council, and then that communication will be translated in a memo by the head of the public service who is a secretary to the council, which I have not seen. I am not aware of it. Have public servants been mobilized to come in for any particular candidate? The answer is no. Because that information would be resident in a circular by the head of the public service. I have not seen one. I have not seen any communication from the public service commission itself to public servants. And public servants are all governed by a code of conduct, which is very strict on how these things are supposed to be done. Thirdly, my friends, all meetings we have with chiefs and assistant chiefs are held in public. We either meet in county commissioners' offices, in church halls, in schools. The most recent meeting that uh, P.S. Kibicho and I had with the chiefs of Nyamira and Kisi was held at Tombe Girls, in a public school, a public place where everybody can access. Government is not a secret society. You, you, you know, the, the, these allegations create an impression that government has been operating like a secret society. Government is not a secret society, which meets somewhere under a tree and conspires. We are not engaged in any conspiracy against anyone. And the things we do are guided by an agenda. And in most cases, we take notes of this. And I am not aware, and we have never had meetings anywhere, to instruct chiefs or instruct assistant chiefs to do whatever needs to be done. Fourthly, which I think is an important point to make, the interface between national government and county government in the implementation of public policy is done through the national government administration. We have worked with chiefs on, and, 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 and assistant chiefs and our deputy county commissioners on 100% transition. We have worked with them on the war against FGM. We have worked with them on the gender violence. We have worked with them on a huge number of issues 
uh, before. And we hold these meetings openly. Right now, as I speak to you, the Ministry of Health is running a campaign jointly with the Ministry of Interior on the triple threats, you know, uh, the resurging numbers of uh, HIV AIDS cases across the country, gender violence, sexual harassment, and so on. And the Ministry of Health officials and health parastators are teaming up with chiefs and assistant chiefs across the country to hold meetings, such as happened in Kiambu last week, and the meetings are taking place across the country. If you see chiefs and assistant chiefs meeting with public health officials, that is what they are discussing. And, and all these people going there, how can it be that we go to those meetings to discuss elections or voting for this person or the other person? There's nothing truthful about this. All, all these are just lies. Uh, plainly speaking, uh, have the PS and the CS been involved in mobilizing chiefs and intimidating them? How can you do it? Because we are bound by our constitution, we are bound by our law, we work in a manner that we know we must be accountable for the things we do, and for anything we do, we can and will be a call to account uh, You know, on, on, on anything we do. I am not aware, and actually I can speak authoritatively, that my peers and I have not engaged in these kinds of things. Every time we have had meetings, we sit down with these wonderful people to review security deployment, to do, uh, you know, planning for the country to ensure that, uh, you know, um, our people are being sorted out and are being managed well across the country. I was in Molo the day before yesterday, uh, where we had a large meeting uh, looking at what are the issues that we have to deal with? Are we prepared? Are we ready? With all the 14 county commissioners and uh, all the uh, 14 county police commanders and the teams that form or comprise the Rift Valley. And we've done this the week before I was in Coast Province for the same reasons. We are not meeting to tell chiefs what to do. Finally, suffice it to say, you know, chiefs are not children. They are not 12-year-olds to be guided and to be dictated upon. I can tell you for a fact, about half of the chiefs understand chiefs in the country are even older than me. Uh, the, some of these are seasoned people, very experienced people, very well trained. We have relied upon them on a number of issues. Now, it's very sad, honestly, that the deputy president singles out four of our senior administrators. The county commissioner for Wazengishu, Mr. Kihara, the county commissioner for Nakuru, Mr. Mbui, the county commissioner for Transoya, Mr. Ujuang, and our regional commissioner for Rift Valley. And to make allegations that are not substantiated, my friend, even the most rudimentary way of addressing issues, even the most basic of common senses, will tell you that if you allege that a meeting has taken place, supply the dates and say, on 17th of July, at this particular time, Mr. Mali Mohammed, the regional commissioner for Rift Valley, met ABCD. How can you, honestly, make claims like those against senior uh, administrators, just sweeping claims that you cannot substantiate, you are not able to uh, be prove that these people are having night meetings, they are moving around and so on and so forth. It is unfortunate uh, that that is coming from a senior leader uh, in the country. We know these officers, they work for us. We work with them. We have faith in these four officers. Our 47 county commissioners in the country, our eight regional commissioners in the country, are some of the senior most officials in the national government administration. Some of them are very highly trained and experienced people. Mr. Malim, who is being insulted in this case and, and, and being accused falsely, is a decorated officer. Our new regional commissioner for Rift Valley, Mr. Malim Mohammed, is a decorated officer who has an impeccable record and his file is there for everyone to see who has served as county commissioner in more, more than six counties in the country. His performance has been uh, rewarded even by the Public Service Commission. He has been named the Public Servant of the Year before, even before we ourselves started working with him. This is a decorated officer who is now being accused of doing illegal things. It is unfair that you would treat public officers in this kind of manner. And on that note, I want to say this. To all my brothers and sisters in the National Government Administration and in the police service, at all ranks, from assistant chief to regional commissioner, from police constables to the inspector general. You are the people who have held this country together during times of challenge such as this. Unfortunately, we cannot speak like them, like the politicians speak. So we don't have the lines of language to insult people and say all manner of things. Let us mind our country 
There's a country to manage. Ignore these things. Do not be discouraged and do not be heartbroken. Do not be disheartened. We will all be accused of all manner of things. I know that at a time like this during the campaign, nerves are raw and, 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 and you know, people are now venting their frustrations, their bent up emotions and disappointments and so on are all now being vented and the, the, the anger is being projected on public administrators. Uh, let us carry on. Many of my senior colleagues, like the regional commissioners, Mr. Thuku is here, have done elections more than I have done. Some of our senior police officers who are standing here with me, our Deputy Inspector General of Police, Mr. Mbowa, DIG, Gabo, and all these wonderful people, our own Inspector General of Police, Mr. Kinoti, you've done elections before, more than now. Let us just persevere, remain focused on the work that we have to do, and deliver for the country. That is the work we have at hand. And we cannot speak like those people. We don't have that lenses of lying you know, to the public and saying things we cannot uh, justify. Uh, unfortunately, though, I have also noted that cases where members of that group of uh, politicians even try to single out the chiefs and name chiefs and try to profile chiefs and so on. On that particular one, I want to be very frank. Mr. Kinoti knows this. We are documenting every one of these criminal activities because profiling public servants like chiefs and assistant chiefs circulating their numbers and accusing them falsely, is endangering the lives of our public servants. These crimes are not covered by the statute of limitation. Some of these leaders need to know they can and will actually be held to account at some point in their lives for some of these things. People have to be responsible in the things they do. I can't stand up in the country and point out and say Mr. Gabo is doing ABCD when I have no evidence, so that now inside the public against my the DIG in, in charge of administration. This is irresponsible behavior. And this is unconscionable conduct. But for some of these leaders, they think it's fair game and it's okay to say the things they are saying and to do the things they are doing. But it's unfortunate for our country. Finally, and I'm going to give you a copy of this statement. Kenyans need to know this. The government has not mobilized any public servants to campaign for anybody, period. Chiefs and assistant chiefs have not been uh, mobilized or instructed to campaign for anyone, period. We do not operate that way. Our responsibility is defined by the law. We are working very hard, working with fellow Kenyans to ensure we support the IEBC to conduct free and fair elections. That we shall do with commitment. We will look neither to the right nor to the left. We will remain focused on that goal to ensure that we serve our people. I am not aware of any scheme or any effort to influence the Communications Authority of Kenya or any effort to influence the Kenya power and lighting to switch off power. Sometimes in a civilized world, some of these claims, I find them too cheap and too ridiculous to even think about. And when they come from the mouths of senior leaders, you sometimes don't know whether to laugh or cry. It's so petty to imagine that an organization that enjoys such institutional autonomy and protection by the law, like the Communications Authority of Kenya, would resort to such primitive things like, you know, interfering. We have said this several times before. I'm, 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 as Minister for Interior, I'm the one who would invoke the Public Order Act. I, we have said it several times because this is a matter that we have all discussed and agreed. We are not going to shut down the internet. We are not going to interfere with social media and so on. Why would we do that? Kenya has come of age. Kenyans are mature people. I agree with His Excellency, the Deputy President. It's true. Kenya is, uh, has a shortage of fools. And I think that applies more to some of those petty claims that he's making and so on than anything else. Because really, how would you, I mean, uh, Communication Authority of Kenya, with the reputation they have? You know, by the way, people forget. We sit at the International Telecommunication Union as a country, at the ITU. We are very respected at the ATU. Uh, Kenya has taken its uh, uh, place of pride and honor in the ICT sector, in the globe. How would we resort to doing some of those petty things like, you know, shut down the internet or oh, CAK has been instructed by who to do what? There is nothing, there is no evidence in any of those claims that have been made. 
And I think at best, and this is my conclusion, Kenyans should just ignore th those things, treat them with the extreme contempt they deserve, and focus on the election day. Let us go, like law-abiding citizens, queue, vote, elect our leaders, and wait for what the IBC will tell us. Our democracy has come of age. This is a wonderful country, and God has been gracious to us. We will do our bit, as I believe every Kenyan is determined to do their bit to ensure we are free and fair election. And ignore these bent-up frustrations that are being vented on security officials and chiefs and so on. We just are on the receiving end of some people's frustrations and disappointments and, and uh, you know, unnecessary anger and so on. Thank you. I can take a few questions. This is Hadu Jamjibu. But you see, when you ask that question, it's two way. Do we have a problem with his excellent the deputy president or he has a problem with us? That is that that is something we need to <laughs> figure out. Because Ababu, that sometimes I ask this, and please allow me on this particular one, I'm going to break out uh, of the edict of collective responsibility. Yeah, so, so I was saying, you know, on, on this particular one, sometimes I ask myself the question, um, does, does His Excellency the Deputy President think anything of anybody? If you look at our sector, there's a pattern to this. I may be mistaken to think, in my view, from the observations I've had, and I'll be very frank with you, that maybe there are two groups of public servants in his worldview. The group that would worship him and bows to him and kiss his shoes, which are the group of human beings, or the group that has the temerity even to say no or seek clarification, which is a group of animals. In our sector alone, who does he think anything about? He cannot in Mujinga, Inspector General is incompetent, Kibicho and myself are animals, uh, you know, and, and it's a pattern to this. For the time I have been at the Ministry of Interior, I can say this publicly, he likes to quote God. But then God is seeing all of us talking here. The pressure under which we have uh, uh, come before to even sack Natembea, for example. They, I have not seen a regional commissioner in Rift Valley that the DP did not want sacked. We came under intense pressure to fire Natembea, even as county commissioner in Narok, then as regional commissioner to fire him from him, insisting he must be fired, even without providing reasons why we should fire him. I, I think sometimes, as I said, there is a pattern to this. Because if you look at the entirety of the security sector, the way we are standing here, if Kinoti uh, Mujinga, uh, Inspector General, is useless. And these are officers. Our DCI is somebody who has been respected enough by his colleagues on the continent to be elected to the board of Interpol. Our Inspector General is somebody who has been respected enough by his colleagues to be elected the president of, Af of Afripol. So, on full view of the TV screens, his colleagues, fellow inspectors general across the continent, see his senior insulting him and calling him incompetent. Don't worry about me. Maybe me and P.S. Kibicho are the animals he describes us to be, or whatever the case may be. Does he think anything about anybody? So it's a question where you should ask yourself, is it us who have a problem with him or he has a problem with us? But I think for the record, and on this particular, and I can speak for my brother here, how can you have a problem with your senior? We have, us, we don't have a problem. Hatuna shita na ye, na ye at all. Sisi tumepewa majukumu ya kufanya na sisi ni watumishu wa serakari. Tunafanya vile tunamurishu na wakubwa wetu na yeye ni mmoja wa wakubwa wetu lakini yale ambayo sisi hatuwezi kufanya hatuwezi kufunja sheria na hata yeye mwenyewe anaelewa wakati tumeitilafiana wakati mamba anataka tufunje sheria labda hapo ndio shida iko labda shida ya kibaki ya kibicho na mimi ni kusema la tu leta what no kusema no for something and even these officers i know 
ya vile wanatusiwa ni kwa sababu labda wakati mwingine wamesema hapana kwa mambo fulani kama hayo kwa hivyo sisi hatuna shida na yeye labda na shida na sisi yeye mwenyewe lakini mimi sichamuuliza na sijakuwa na nafasi ya kumuuliza na labda sitakuwa na nafasi ya kumuuliza kwa sababu najua katika protocol ya serikali unajua hata mkono uwezi kunyoosha mkono kwa mkubwa wako unaongojea mkubwa wako akusalimie yeye mwenyewe ndiye anakuambia vile tunaendelea sasa siku ile atatuambia vile sisi ni nyangao ni nini sote tu tutaendelea tu lakini nafikiri wazazi wetu wanajua hawakuzaa nyangao walizaa binadamu Can you give me an example of who, who has claimed their lives are in danger? Please, le, le, let me explain this. And my colleagues here will allow me to say something which is not usual. The decisions we make in the security sector are driven by data and accurate information. The Inspector General or the DCI or the DIG Mbogo or DIG uh, Gabo will not make a decision based on whims or ordinary things. And we collect information on a regular basis all the time. We, 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 and, and we are driven by data. You know, we are intelligence-led in the decisions we make. There's something in the security sector we call a threat profile. Threat profile is when we wake up in the morning and most of these gentlemen who are standing before you here, we start interactions from as early as sometimes 4 a.m. in the morning or 3 or sometimes depending on what the night has thrown to us, we are awake all night. We look at what are the major threats we are facing as a, as a, as a, as a country and we start working on them. And we have a threat profile where you, you, you look at, you know, Al-Shabaab is now giving us problems, blah, blah, they are targeting this, they are doing this and so on. Then you go all the way from number one to whatever number, as it were. Your deployment and your focus, or if you are going to follow somebody, it is because you believe that in that thread profile they rank very high. I've said this before when I was called to parliament one time. Some of those individuals who are saying that the police are after them or they are threatening them, in the thread profile between number one and 500, they are not there. Which means there are people, even a cockroach cannot spend time thinking about it. Because you see... They, they, they are of no threat to anybody. They are just they are doing their job as politicians. They are talking. You know what one hour. And and talking is not a threat because you see that is what they are paid to do. Because if you are a politician, your practice is in Kuongea. Which means as you talk around, even a lizard passing around is not worried about you. So why should Imboa deploy police officers after you? You are not a threat to anybody. In fact, if anything, you're only a threat to yourself. You're not a threat to anyone. So I don't understand who those people are who are claiming that their lives are in danger. But anyway, the truth of the matter, and many of them, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I hope we'll finish before another plane. Uh, so those who are making those claims, some of these sympathy-seeking or sympathy-craving, uh, you know, publicity stunts uh, about, the, oh, my life is in danger and so on, police are after me, and these gentlemen have better things to do. And as I told you, if, if, if they have to go to look at somebody, they look at the thread profile. Where do you feature? If between number one and 600, you don't feature, why would a senior police officer, uh, like, you know, the Omboa spend time on you? Honestly, and deploy police to look after you. You are not a threat to anybody. You are not a threat to. Uh, you are not a threat to anybody. If anything, you are a threat to yourself. So why would we now say you put police officers behind you and so on? So people keep making all these silly claims around. But anyway, any time anybody has come up and said, "I have a problem," and they, genuinely there is a problem, the Inspector General has always deployed. In fact, even this morning I was meeting some observers who were asking me, "Oh, you know, there are political leaders who are saying." They need more security. Anyone who has walked up to the Inspector General Police or any of his structures and requested for additional security will get it. And let me repeat it here again today. Wherever you are, Mr. So and so, Madam So and so, wherever you are, if you feel that you actually need more protection and more security, please walk straight to the police station next to you, talk to the OCS there and report the matter, or look for your sub county police commander or your county commander, whoever you will meet we will give you security that you need. It is your right. We will not be doing you a favor. 
it is your right and it's our duty to make sure that you are safe. But these other claims that people are making, as I told you, when you look at the threat profile and you discover the person who's claiming that, oh, his life is in danger and we have deployed police vehicles to follow him around, you discover it's somebody who, as I've told you, even a cockroach he will not bother to think about for a second time. On the justice, that now that is where we part ways because you know security matters. You cannot subject them to propaganda, you know, and gossip and all those kinds of things. First of all. As the rule of thumb, I tell you, my brothers and sisters, you know this for a fact. I want, you also want a responsible minister of interior in your country. When investigations are going on, as a rule of thumb, and our this year is here, we have agreed in the security sector. We don't run sideline commentaries when investigations are going on. Because then we interfere with the work of the officers who are uh, you know, doing the investigations. The matter of the leaflets, some investigations are going on. We've already taken uh, some uh, people to court. And we are continuing to look for more information so that we get to the very bottom of the matter. But the process uh, of punishment has begun. We will present the information we have and uh, our officers will present the information they have and it, then the courts will decide who is right and who is wrong. And I don't want to comment more about that. On the matter of the Venezuelans, you know, these are two institutions, two independent institutions. You forget one thing. The Office of the Inspector General of Police under the law is an independent office. And the IEBC is an independent institution. The two institutions come together and look at an issue like the one of the consultants or people who have been hired to do the work they are doing. In their wisdom, they take a decision and all the issues involved have been explained and sorted out. And, and they, they agree that we have now explained all the gray areas on this matter. We are on the same page. Let us move forward. And they decide responsibly, I believe as responsible people, that let us not engage in press commentaries that are going to affect uh, you know, the conduct of the general elections. Why would we want to go back to them again and tell them, okay, so what happened? How many cups of tea did you take during that meeting? Uh, who said what and so on? Let's trust our Inspector General Police. Let's trust Mr. Jebukati, the chairman of the IBC, on the decision they took on that matter. I am satisfied myself when I was briefed by the decisions of the Inspector General of Police, and we are fine. And then the, he has briefed us on the conversations he had with the IBC on the matter. We are satisfied completely with how they resolved the matter. And we believe that is the responsible way of managing these affairs. Let us proceed now to another matter. On the issue of the House of the DPP, again, it applies to what I told you earlier. I don't want to make sideline comments now when, when a matter as sensitive as that uh, you know, has happened. Now, you already have jumped to conclusions before investigations are done. Now, my brother... If we go that way, we will hurt ourselves. Let us always be focused. When something has happened, we have competent officers, we have competent teams. They come up, they investigate the matter. Wana chunguza, wana tafta ukweli mahali uko. Kama kuna ushaidi wa kutosha, mambo fulani ya mefanyika, wa usika wanapatikana, alavu wanapelekwa kotini. Tunataka kufuata sheria na tunataka kuishi kisheria. Vila tunatakiwa kuishi. Sasawa. Oh. No, I will explain, and those are two different issues, and thank you for asking me the question. Number one, and I repeat it again, in a society of our kind, and all societies around the world, leadership is organized in the manner in which our leadership is organized. Can you imagine a case where the president says one thing and the minister says another and the inspector general says another? We don't want chaos in our society. In the security sector, when it comes to policy and implementation of government policy, 
we queue behind the president. That's what I've told chiefs. If the president says 100% transition from primary to secondary, and I want every child in school, how can you not do it in your location when you are a chief? And the president has said that. If the president has committed himself, even at the UN, on goals that we must meet on this FGM thing, how can you tell me as a chief that you're not going to go around the villages to fight FGM because that is what the president has said and that is what national government has committed itself to? So this is what we must do. And I will repeat it again. Now and any time in my life, even when I am not minister for interior, I would wish that the next minister of interior also lives that way organizes the national government infrastructure to queue behind the president and national policy. That is how we manage the country. Because imagine a case where the president says, we are going to work with the Minister of Education to fight examination cheating. Then tomorrow the chiefs say, no, us, we are not going to do that kind of thing. What kind of country are you going to have? So that is what I meant when I tell chiefs, and I tell them even to this day, on national policy, and when the president takes a decision on the matter and the president spells out a position, I am the first to queue behind my president, and I'm followed by my colleagues. That is how it is going to be, and that is how it should be for us to have an orderly environment. On the question of elections and campaigns, let's stop pretending about one thing. Even the judges of the High Court, the judges of the Court of Appeal, and the judges of the Supreme Court will vote. But the matters on which they are voting, some of them may come before them. There is a clear line between my inclination and my responsibility. My obligation and my inclination. All of us here, the way we are seated here, even my colleagues here, I don't know, some of them are Muslims, they go to the mosque on Friday, others are Catholics, they go to church on Sunday, others are Anglicans, they go to church on Sunday, others like me are Seventh-day Adventists, they go to church on Saturday. But when we come to work, we have our obligations. I will not wear the lenses of my religious inclination. I will not wear the lenses of my faith. I will, if you come before me, I will not ask you where you belong to and where you come from. I am not supposed to do that under the law. I have an obligation. I have a legal obligation. So there is, must be a line drawn between legal ob obligations and personal inclinations. To pretend here that people do not have any, even our officers, police officers will vote. They have inclinations. They may have preferences. But they know that when they wake up in the morning and they are wearing Kofia, Kiraoni, Anabeba, Bunduki, they are going to work. They are going there to serve every Kenyan. And they will not ask every Kenyan, where did you vote? No, no, no. That's you are not allowed to do. So let us agree on this particular matter. There, there is a very clear light between obligations and inclinations. And there is nothing wrong with people having, you know, inclinations. That, that is why we are a democracy. The people have opinions. They have preferences. And no one forces anyone to, you don't have to agree with me. You don't have to I agree with, I don't have to agree with you, but I can express myself and say, as far as I'm concerned, I think this is the way we should go. That's my opinion. Even in the offices where we work, we have different opinions sometimes on issues. But we don't sack people because they have expressed differences of opinion, because we understand the line between obligations and inclinations. And this is what people oftentimes confuse and so on. The constitution says the president will appoint cabinet ministers who are technocrats. It doesn't say the president will appoint robots switch on and switch of robots to the cabinet. And then I guess, by the way, some of the politicians who are hypocritically parroting that around the country are the same ones who keep saying uh, perhaps we should have ministers who are elected members of parliament who sit in parliament. So what is what? <laughs> you know, because, you know, these contradictions sometimes uh, you know, are interesting. Let's be very plain and very clear. I will not lie to you. I have inclinations and I have preferences. But I'll also be very sincere with you. I will deliver on my constitutional obligations without fear or favor. And when it comes to that, I will remove my inclinations and, and serve every Kenyan as I'm supposed to serve. And I've done that before. And everyone else who's serious has done that before. But let's stop these excuses, you know, saying, oh, oh, you have expressed preferences and so on. We express preferences all the time. That's why you are dressed in jeans and I'm dressed in suits. I mean, we, that's a different way of looking at things. Thank you. <laughs>